Hello, can you all hear me? Yes, I can hear you. That's it. Um, so good afternoon, everyone, and I hope you're all doing well. Um, and thank you for joining us today um, for the webinar session. Uh, my name is Kamal, I'm one of the relationship managers at HCA Healthcare UK, um, and I'm delighted to introduce the today's speaker, Dr. Helen Bra, um, consultant in paediatric allergy, um, and she'll be providing a talk on the latest updates of paediatric food allergy. Um, Helen is the head of children's allergy and the uh, children's allergy services and specialty group lead for the range of paediatric services at the Evelina London Children's Hospital. Um, and she also works privately at the Portland Hospital. Her clinical interests are in food allergy, um, which she leads the PRONUT study. Um, she also has an interest in immunotherapy, asthma, eosinophilic gastrointestinal disorders, and ischemia. Um, before I pass it over to Helen, uh, we're going to have a couple um, housekeeping requests. Um, if I could kindly ask you, everyone to mute their microphones during the talk. Um, there will be a Q&A session at the end. So if anybody has questions, um, please leave them towards the end. Um, and also, after the session, um, there will be a survey link which will be emailed to you. Um, it will be great if you could complete it, um, as we really appreciate your feedback. Um, so without further ado, I'll pass it over to you, Helen. Thank you very much, Kamal. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah, we can. Great. Okay, fantastic. Thanks for the introduction. So I'm going to be talking to you today about the latest update in paediatric food allergy. I'm assuming that you're all um, uh, interested in allergy because you're on this webinar. So I'm going to be giving you uh, something which is which is not a, a basic food allergy talk. It's going to be something uh, t telling you about the, the next level, which we are now able to do in allergy, which is uh, a very exciting time to be able to do a lot more for our allergy patients. So uh, without further ado, I will carry on with the background. So the allergic march is a, a concept which is essentially the idea that different allergic conditions are related and not only are they related as we know that eczema and food allergy are related and asthma and hay fever are related, but that one precedes the other and that potentially this might be a way to prevent uh, these, these allergies from developing. So this is the classic type of patient that I will see in my clinic, a child uh, with early onset severe eczema, particularly around the face, looks very angry, might be a bit infected. We know that infected eczema is also a big risk factor for developing food allergy. When the child develops the food allergies, these can be transient food allergies like milk and egg, or they can be persistent food allergies like uh, sesame, nuts, or fish. And then the young adults can develop allergic rhinitis and also asthma. And so we see that one of these uh, generally uh, is followed by another in many patients. And so one of the big questions has been whether we could try to prevent this from happening. To start with a case, uh, this is uh, a girl we'll call Olivia, who is six months old. Both of her parents have got hay fever, and we often find that actually it's hay fever that is the link to food allergy. And um, they're exclusively, uh, the child is exclusively breastfed and develops severe eczema from three weeks of age. So the eczema was managed initially by standard moisture and 1% hydrocortisone, but it did not improve. Uh, and then at six months of age, she was given her first bottle of cow's milk protein formula and she developed urticaria and stridor. I'm getting an annotation request. Um, I'll just uh, decline that for the moment. Um, maybe uh, help with that, please. Um, so, uh, yes, so this child has ha had anaphylaxis to cow's milk. Uh, they all have been uh, given a little bit of scrambled egg, but spat it out immediately, and they have a persistent nocturnal cough. Okay, so my screen has now frozen, Kamal. I wondered if you could give me a hand. Okay, I can just click on the screen. So Olivia has got um, some blood test results which have come through and the cow's milk result is over 100 and the egg is 30 kilo units per litre. These are specific IgE tests and peanut is 40 kilo units per litre. 
And we also know from the history, uh, given that she's a very atopic child, that this dry cough at night may be more than just coughs or colds. It may be a sign of early asthma. So what is the outlook for our six-month-old baby? She has severe eczema. She has food allergy already, cow's milk allergy, and based on the aversion to egg and the results on allergy testing, both egg and peanut allergy. And she has possible asthma. So she's only six months old and she already has all of these conditions. And this is what happens in allergy, that there is a very short window of opportunity to be able to intervene, to be able to prevent these types of things from happening. So what could we have done differently? So the first thing we could have done is potentially try to prevent her from developing eczema. And there's been a lot of research in this area, which I'll talk to you about a little bit later on. Mm -hmm. Then what about um, once she developed the severe eczema, could we have done anything to prevent her from developing food allergy? And I'm going to be talking to you about some of the things that you could potentially do in primary care to try to prevent food allergy. And then there's tertiary. This is when somebody already has established food allergies. How can we improve function and quality of life? So can we speed up her egg and milk allergy resolution? Can we use food immunotherapy for her peanut allergy, for example? And these are all things that are done um, in specialist uh, settings by pediatric allergists. So the changing management of food allergy is, is I'm sure, quite clear for those of you who were practicing in 2007. At the time, uh, we were told to strictly avoid all the known food allergens and just provide suitable alternatives. There was no uh, active tolerance induction. We were just uh, seeing the families every year to two years to see if the allergy test came down, to see if they naturally grew out of their allergies. And also in many centers, people were only testing for the food that the child had reacted to. So if the child came in with a urticaria rash to egg, they would just be tested for egg. Now, it's been for a few years now that things have quite substantially changed in the field of food allergy. So now what happens is that there's a balancing act between avoiding allergens and promoting the acquisition of tolerance. For example, that means that for certain types of foods that we know become less allergenic when you heat them extensively, like cow's milk and egg, under specialist settings, the baked form of the food can be introduced to try to speed up the resolution of the cow's milk and egg allergy. And also, now what's happening is that if a child arrives with an egg allergy, they also get tested for certain foods that are associated with egg allergy, in particular peanut, because uh, through that there is a way to prevent peanut allergy, which I'll talk about uh, a bit later on in my presentation. So active allergy management is the term that we're using now, which is uh, a different way of managing allergy to the way that we were doing this before. Before it was a very conservative approach with just avoidance and waiting it out. So what can we do for active allergy management? Can we prevent eczema? Can we prevent food allergy? Can we do active tolerance induction once the child already has the food allergies? So the background for all of this is something called the dual allergen exposure hypothesis. Um, and this is a, a nice figure which basically talks about all the different risk factors for food allergy. So at the bottom, you can see uh, where the little bugs are, the hygiene hypothesis, essentially having the right type of gut microbiome helps you to have a tolerizing type of response to the allergens around you. Whereas if you have a uh, gut dysbiosis, um, then you are more likely to develop an allergy. And this is all derived from your environment, from things like the diversity of the food that you eat and the environmental exposures uh, whether you're living in a farming environment uh, in the stables or whether you're living in an urbanized environment. Then you have the vitamin D hypothesis right at the top, which is the sunshine, which uh, vitamin D exposure has been shown to improve uh, the regulatory parts of our immune system and so can help with uh, some uh, prevention of allergy, although this evidence for this is not as strong as for some of the other uh, areas of research. And what I'm going to be talking about today mainly is the dual allergen exposure hypothesis, which is in the middle. And essentially, this is the concept that, particularly in the first year of life, depending on whether you get exposed to foods through the skin or whether you get exposed through the gut, you are more likely to develop either allergy through the skin or tolerance through the gut. 
And the reason for this is that if you imagine a child who's got inflamed, disrupted skin barrier with eczema, having environmental exposure to foods, then they can go through the skin barrier and cause inflammation and an allergic response. And we know from research, my, my PhD looked at peanut levels in the environment. And if you eat a peanut butter sandwich in your home, the following day, your uh, bed will be full of peanut. The dust will be full of peanut. And if you have a young infant, their bed will also be full of peanut. So there's a lot of environmental that we didn't really know about before, but we're learning about now. Conversely, if a child is exposed to foods through the gut, the gut is a predominantly tolerizing organ, especially if you have the right kind of bugs in your gut, the friendly bacteria in your gut, then the predominant response to the foods is a, a tolerant response. So that's the dual allergen exposure hypothesis. It depends on where you're exposed to the allergen as to whether you develop allergy or tolerance. So prevention of eczema. A lot of work has been looked into why people get eczema, and it's a combination of two things. It's a skin barrier problem. So they have dry skin because they're losing water through their skin because they have porous skin, which also means that allergens and irritants and infections through the skin. Then you have an immune response, which is an inflammatory red response. And you'll see that in children, the flexures on their face, they get red, they get very angry looking skin, which is the inflammation. And eczema is a combination of both of those things. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion as to what came first. Does the barrier dysfunction come first or does the um, immunological response comes first? And since the discovery of the phalagrin gene, which is a gene in your skin, actually forms the skin barrier properly, we now know that that's highly related to eczema. So the general consensus is now that the skin barrier comes first and then the immunological response goes second. So if we think about it uh, from a theoretical point of view, you would think that due to the skin barrier dysfunction, there might be ways to protect that skin barrier by putting moisturizers on, for example. So what we want to do is prevent a child who has normal looking skin to becoming a child with eczematous skin. The um, studies, the pilot studies that looked at the concept that I mentioned. So a child who has potentially a family history of hay fever or eczema, applying moisturizers from birth was thought to be potentially a good way to prevent eczema. And this was a very exciting uh, year in 2014, when these two studies came out, which showed that potentially through applying standard moisturizers like double base gel we have in the UK, uh, or white soft paraffin, uh, and in the US they use slightly different creams, but they were all petrolatum based creams, standard moisturizing creams, that there was a reduction in the onset of eczema by about 50% in the US and UK pilot arm, and about a third. So it looked from the pilot studies that potentially applying emollients from could prevent the development of eczema, and then there was the hope that this could also prevent the development of has recently been published in the Lancet um, just uh, a few weeks ago uh, was a very uh, large randomized controlled study in the UK called the BEEP study and this looked at children that were high risk because their parents had a history of ATP and they had preventative emollient therapy applied um, from very early on in life from the first couple of weeks in life and they had that applied for the whole of the first year and then they looked to see whether they could prevent eczema developing at two years. Uh, the moisturizers that they use were generally the double base or the dipper base cream, creams that we use in the UK. Unfortunately, they did not find that there was any reduction in eczema, uh, which was significant. So in the moisturizing group, it was 23%, and then the control group, it was 25%. So there was no difference in eczema. In fact, what they showed was that there was an increase in parent reported skin infections in the children that were having the emollients applied. And one could imagine potentially that if the parents aren't washing their hands before putting moisturizer onto the child's skin, that they could be transferring their skin onto their child. And what I've often seen, to be honest, in, 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 in clinic is that parents who get prescribed ointments, for example, epiderm, 
they will put their hand into the pot and then onto the child's skin and then put their hand back into the pot and that then becomes a breeding ground for bacteria. Finally, they showed that in the group that had moisturizers applied, there was actually a small increase in food allergy when they assessed this at two years. Milk, egg or peanut allergies, which is what they assessed by Food Challenge. And they showed that in the moisturizing arm, it was 7.5%. In the control arm, it was 5.1%. So this was not statistically significant, but there was a small increase in food allergy. So essentially, based on this study, it doesn't look like applying moisturizers from birth is the right thing to do for children to prevent eczema or to prevent food allergy. Now, this does not mean that once the child has eczema, that it's uh, not a good thing to apply moisturizers to repair the skin barrier. But at least this study showed that from birth to try and prevent it in a child with normal skin, it is not the right approach. So it just shows how things can be very different from the pilot studies to the randomized controlled trial. And for example, in Australia, based on the pilot studies, they had already invested hundreds of thousands of dollars to implement this strategy into their public health measures. Uh, and now they're going to have to reverse that. I talked to you about two things. I talked to you about barrier function and I talked to you about inflammation um, in eczema. There is actually a study that's just come out recently, which is a retrospective study, so should be taken with caution, but they are now doing a large randomized controlled trial called the PACHI study to look into this in more detail, where they've shown that um, early proactive topical steroids reduces food allergy. So in this study, they had children with moderate to severe eczema. So these are children who already have eczema versus the children in the previous study that were um, before the development of eczema. Then these, these children had moderate to severe eczema. They were grouped into two groups, those that were applied steroid creams before four months and those that were applied the steroid creams after four months. And they showed that earlier application of topical steroids reduced food allergy. And what they meant by topical steroids was moderate steroids to the body and mild steroids to the face. And what they did was a two week course of these topical steroids to clear the skin and then using topical steroids twice a week thereafter to prevent it from coming back. This is what the dermatologists call weak therapy, uh, but essentially you can just space it out during the week, twice a week. So you can see here that there was a 45% reduction in food allergy by two years of age in the group that had early treatment with topical steroids. And even more exciting was that in children who were already on their way to becoming egg allergic because they were sensitized to egg, they showed that applying topical steroids from under four months of age showed a 60% reduction in egg allergy. So we need to have more data in this area, but potentially it's going to be looking at reducing inflammation, which might be able to help with the prevention of food allergy. So uh, the next topic will be about prevention of food allergy directly. I'm sure that you will have heard about the LEAP study. This was a large uh, randomized controlled trial that was done at the Evelina Children's Hospital uh, by the, our pediatric team. And we recruited children with severe eczema or who had egg allergy that we know is a risk factor for peanut allergy. And at the time in 2006, when the recruitment started up until 2009, the Department of Health recommended avoiding peanuts uh, for the first three years of life if somebody in the family had uh, atopy. And so at the time, the control arm was going along with the Department of Health advice to avoid peanuts. The intervention arm had peanut introduced in a safe form for an infant. These were children between the age of four and 11 months. They were either given peanut butter mixed in with foods, or they were given these uh, puffs, these uh, peanut flour puffs called bamba. And they were asked to eat uh, two, a minimum of two grams of peanut protein um, per week until they were five years of age. And then at the end of the five years or 60 months, they came in and they had a food challenge to peanut to see whether avoiding peanut was better to prevent peanut allergy or introducing peanut was better to prevent peanut allergy. And what they showed here was that uh, in the intention to treat group, which is essentially the group where everybody is included, regardless as to whether they did what you asked them or didn't do what you asked them, there was an 81% relative reduction in peanut allergy in the group that were eating peanut. So eating the peanut protected against having 
peanut allergy at five years of age. And this was found to be highly effective both in children who had initially a negative skin prick test to peanut when they were assessed, and in those who had a positive skin prick test to peanut already between one and four millimeters. So even in those children, there was a 70% positive reduction in peanut allergy by eating the peanut regularly. Uh, subsequently, uh, we did another study. This was the inquiring about tolerance study, the EAT study. Uh, so the LEAP study was about children who already had moderate to severe eczema. The EAT study was a population-based study, so it needed to be much larger, 1,300 children. And these were children without a risk factor for um, allergy. They were just people who self-referred from the general population. And in this, uh, they wanted to introduce six allergenic foods from three months of age, and these were children that were exclusively breastfeeding. So they asked them to introduce the six foods from three months of age whilst breastfeeding, versus the other group were asked to just continue breastfeeding until six months of age. And then they followed up these children until they were three years old, and they brought them back to have food challenges to the six different foods to see if this would uh, help with preventing allergy to these foods. Foods that were used in the study, so milk, peanut, fish, sesame, egg, and wheat. And they were introduced in this, uh, they were introduced in these doses. Uh, milk was yogurt, peanut was peanut butter, fish fingers, teaspoons of tahini, small egg, or wheat-based cereal. These were the doses that people were asked to eat on a weekly basis. You can see here that it was actually very difficult for families to introduce all of these six foods regularly. So you can see that for wheat, which was the one that was introduced four months of age, it was only 39% of families that were able to introduce this. So what they found was that in the intention to treat group, which is the group of children that you include everybody, regardless as to what they, did, they do in the study, there was a small reduction in food allergy in the early introduction group, but is not, it, this was not statistically significant. However, if you looked at the children that did actually do what they were asked to do, there was a 75% reduction in egg allergy. And if you looked at children that already have um, a positive test on blood testing to egg, even in the group that, had, that were intention to treat, i.e. the whole of the study group, there was a 57% reduction in egg allergy. So it showed that essentially in this population, if they had a slightly positive IgE test to egg, introducing egg regularly, from three months of age was able to reduce egg allergy by 57%. Then they looked at peanut allergy. And uh, in peanut allergy, again, in the intention to treat group of all children, there was a small reduction in peanut allergy, which was not statistically significant. But then if you looked at those that did what they were asked to do in the per protocol group, there was a 100% reduction in peanut allergy. And if you looked at the whole group, the intention to treat group that had a positive IgE test of more than 0.1 to peanut, if they introduced peanut, they had a 59% reduction in peanut allergy. And this is in a group um, that was recruited from the general population. So what does this mean in clinical practice? Now in the USA, after the LEAP study, brought out some guidance, which I'll talk you through, and then I'll talk about the UK guidance. So in the US, they suggest that in infants with severe eczema or egg allergy, the peanut-containing foods should be introduced from four to six months of age, and that they recommend allergy testing before introduction. In infants with mild or moderate eczema, they recommend introducing peanut-containing foods at six months at home without being needed to be assessed by a specialist. However, they comment that some carers will want to be assessed um, or may want to have an in-office uh, supervised. And then infants without eczema or any food allergy were just asked to introduce peanut-containing foods freely into the diet. This is the advice from the UK, and this can be found uh, in the BSACI uh, website, which is the British Society for Allergy and Clinical Immunology. There is a section there on early feeding guidelines. So this is essentially more relevant for the UK. So in their guideline, uh, they recommend that infants with a known risk factor for food allergy, such as eczema or existing food allergy in the baby, 
They obviously need to avoid any foods that the baby is known to be allergic to. Uh, but in those that uh, the child is not known to be allergic to, they recommend that when the baby is ready, and that means that the baby can hold their head up for five, five seconds without it dropping, um, that they introduce cooked egg and then peanut in four months of age, followed by other allergenic foods. Uh, they do state that some children who have moderate to severe eczema will be at greater risk and that they may benefit from screening. However, they are aware that in the UK, there is not the option to screen everywhere. And so they recommend that if there is no possibility to screen the child, because no life-threatening reactions have been reported in this context, that they should not delay the introduction of these foods beyond 12 months of age. So if you are somewhere um, outside London in general, because in London there are good testing facilities, in, usually uh, at the moment with COVID it's a bit different, uh, the, the recommendation is to is, uh, test if you can in a child who has moderate to severe eczema, but if they just have mild eczema or no eczema, then just to introduce. This is some information which is also very useful. A lot of people say, well, their brother or their sister has a peanut allergy. I want to have my child tested. Uh, that is not necessary. So screening allergy tests are not routinely recommended prior to introducing solids. So you can safely reassure these parents that they can introduce these foods into the diet. And obviously, if the child has um, no uh, eczema or no atopic conditions, uh, no risk factors for food allergy, then you can do the same. Okay, so um, my screen has frozen again. I'm just going to try and. Okay, so um, I'm aware that I want to give some time for questions. Um, active tolerance induction is something that is done mainly in a specialist setting. So I'll go through this quite quickly so that we have time for some questions. Um, so essentially active tolerance induction can only be done if you know what the child is allergic to and you can anticipate some allergies. For example, as I mentioned before, if you've got egg allergy, you're likely to um, have peanut allergy in about 20 to 30 percent of cases. However, I don't recommend doing broad IgE panels in patients, especially those with eczema, because if they do have positive IgE tests, which they often will in eczema, you know, low levels like 1 or 1.5, They'll come to me having excluded the food in clinic, and then in usual circumstances, um, outside of the COVID outbreak, we can only do one or two food challenges a year. In the NHS, privately, obviously, it's different. We can do more. However, for doing broad IgE panels, the patients usually take the foods out, even if they're advised not to. Introducing baked milk or egg um, can help to speed up tolerance. Again, this is only done under allergist supervision. And then food immunotherapy is again only done under allergist supervision. So, questions about the anticipatory testing. We know that egg predicts peanut, peanut predicts tree nuts and sesame, tree nuts predict other tree nuts, uh, but you do need to have the challenge facilities. If you have a two or three millimeter wheel, you need to be able to un introduce that um, uh, under supervision so that you can introduce the food into the diet. And then again, just to advise not to do broad IgE, IgE panels, because it, it can be very difficult to unpick after that. The ProNut study, which essentially took children with one nut allergy and tested them for all the other nuts to see if they were allergic or not. And we found that um, on average, people were only allergic to two nuts and that um, up to nine nuts could be introduced into the diet. Uh, and that improved their quality of life. So baked egg and milk introduction. So actually a very high number of children who've got milk and egg allergy can tolerate baked forms of that food, 75 to 70%. But this is not applicable to nuts, seeds, or fish, because these actually, if you heat them, become more allergenic. So the introduction of baked egg and milk has been shown to speed up tolerance, and this can be uh, very effective. So baked milk, 16 times more likely to tolerate plain milk, and baked egg is 15 times more likely to tolerate plain egg. So you can speed up the resolution. But again, this needs to be done under pediatric allergy supervision because some children can have anaphylaxis to the baked form of the food. And then food immunotherapy, again, is only under allergy supervision. And I just want to mention a few things about food immunotherapy because there was quite a lot of this in the media so that you're aware of the, of the pros and cons of this. 
and this is the uh, FDA approved peanut allergy drug. This is, of course, the reason why people want to do food immunotherapy to protect their child from dying from accidental exposure to the food. And this is particularly for nuts, but also milk is for children uh, the second leading cause of death. Um, this is the sad story uh, about Karambe Chima, who died after having cheese thrown at him at school. This is just the uh, evidence to show that although in adults, the people who have fatal food anaphylaxis are mainly due to nuts, in children in blue, you can see that 21% of deaths were due to milk. And there have been some other cases in the media of things like meat being based in milk and uh, teenagers dying from this when they eat in restaurants. So we know that if you do do immunotherapy, it can protect you against accidental exposure so that you don't react. However, it's not without um, its own risks and it is, it is something not suitable for all patients. Um, so if you do peanut immunotherapy, there is um, evidence that shows that you are much more likely to have allergic reactions during the updosing than if you just avoid peanut. Um, and also, essentially, if you take the immunotherapy, you're going to have to take it for the rest of your life, every single day. You can't just eat that food regularly in terms of, um, you, for example, with peanut. You have your one or two peanuts every day. You can't then go out and have a satay. Uh, uh, you have to restrict your activities whilst you're taking the doses. However, for some people, restricted their lives, who don't go out, who don't go on holiday, who never eat out, who don't go to play dates, who are homeschooling, it may be good for these families to do, to try and reduce some of the anxiety to protect them from accidental exposure. So these are my summary slides. Um, and these are the things that we've talked about, which are uh, very much something that you can do in primary care. So how can we prevent food allergy? Unfortunately, although we were hoping that preventative emollient therapy would work for the prevention of eczema and also food allergy, the latest results show that it does not prevent eczema or food allergy. If anything, it potentially even increases food allergy slightly. There might be some uh, evidence for early proactive steroid creams, and I would always recommend, you know, in a child who's got inflamed eczema, please treat that with topical steroids. Uh, and the, the proactive steroid cream uh, regimen, which is doing it daily until it clears and then twice weekly to prevent it from coming back, has been shown to be safe with mild steroids, even moderate steroids on the body uh, for up to four months, not thinning the skin. So I would urge you to try and use those uh, in the children that you see with eczema in your, in your clinics. Uh, early introduction of allergenic foods. Um, I'm hoping that from the LEAP and the EAT study, but there's many other studies that have also looked into this, that particularly for egg and peanut, there is quite strong evidence now that introducing these early into the diet can prevent the development of these allergies. These are only to be done under the supervision of an allergist for managing food allergies, so introducing baked egg or baked milk, selective nut introductions as per the pro-nut study, Food immunotherapy is something that we are uh, starting to provide NHS and also provide privately. Um, we haven't yet started doing peanut immunotherapy on the NHS or privately. And obviously at the moment, given COVID, um, these uh, day case facilities have, have stopped. And then this is just a brief summary, um, which you're probably all aware of, is the rationale for secondary care referral. So for IgE-mediated symptoms to food allergy, anaphylaxis, IgE-mediated food allergy with concurrent asthma, possible multiple food allergies, or strong clinical suspicion of food allergy despite negative tests would warrant a referral. And these um, criteria come from the NICE guidelines. Whereas for non-IgE-mediated food allergy, which I haven't covered very much today, but I'd be happy to do a session on cow's milk allergy at, at another uh, session, is uh, if you have faltering growth in associated with gastrointestinal symptoms, or if the child doesn't respond to a single elimination diet. And I'm sure you're aware of the IMAP guidelines, which are for um, delayed calcium protein allergy. Then significant eczema where multiple food allergies are suspected. Again, please don't do the uh, panel of IgE tests before they come to see us, just, just refer, and then we can unpick it. And then persistent parental suspicion of food allergy despite lack of supporting history. So these are the uh, criteria for referral, and I'm obviously very happy these slides will all be available for you after this talk.
And then I've done a, a podcast with uh, the Portland Hospital, and um, this is available for you to listen to if you would like to find out a bit more about uh, food allergy, asthma, hay fever, eczema. And these are the contacts for referral uh, to me. So, uh, as you're probably aware, the Portland and the Shard currently don't have pediatric outpatient facilities because of COVID. Um, and uh, so I'm offering video and telephone consultations at the moment and hopefully we'll be able to return to face-to-face -face consultations very soon. Um, so thank you very much all for your attention. Very happy for, to take some questions now. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Farrell, for your excellent talk. Um, as said, we're going to have some Q&A, so if anybody has any questions, please unmute your mic or you can type it in the chat box and I'll read it out for you. Do you have any questions, anybody? Can I, um, I don't know whether you can hear me. Uh, I can hear you. Okay, thanks, Helen. Um, could I ask about the role of the microbiome, and whether you feel that is in any way helpful and should mothers during pregnancy be taking probiotics or infants in the first weeks of life? Could you say a bit about that? Thank you. Uh, so, there have been a lot of studies on the use of probiotics and prebiotics in pregnancy and in infancy. So, during pregnancy, um, almost all the guidelines say that there is no evidence to support the use of probiotics in pregnancy. Uh, there is one uh, guideline from the World Allergy Organization which says that there is very weak evidence to support probiotics in the last trimester of pregnancy uh, for the prevention of eczema, but the evidence is very weak. So I would say that for for um, it's not it's it's not very strong for for uh, infancy and uh, during lactation. Again, the studies have shown there was a big study called the Presto study, which looked at supplementing children who had a uh, delayed calcium protein allergy or or immediate calcium protein allergy, and they showed that by using the uh, probiotics that they were able to improve the gut flora of these children and make them more like the children who don't have cow's milk allergy. So they had more bifidobacteria in them and lack. But actually, when they followed them up later on, there was no evidence that this um, uh, expedited the resolution of cow's milk allergy. So what I would say is that there's not strong evidence at the moment for this. Uh, but I, I, I would say that if a child, for example, has had antibiotics at birth, has had courses of antibiotics and has gut symptoms and has potentially delayed calcium protein allergy. I, I don't think there's any harm in using probiotics. I generally go for um, you know, probiotics that are safe in, in, in young babies in, in a way that can be administered safely. Thank you. Can, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, children that are born by a cesarean section um, also have an influence on their microbiome in a negative way. Um, is there a link between um, developing food allergies, eczema, and those children that are um, born uh, vaginally or by cesarean section? Yes. So there is an increased risk of eczema in children that are born by cesarean section. What's interesting is, is that. It's elective cesarean section, which is more of the risk because emergency cesarean section, the child has already been exposed uh, for the most part to the, the flora in the birth canal. It's all about being exposed to the uh, different uh, bacteria in the birth canal that is uh, protective against the development of other types of um, uh, allergies. So elective cesareans are the ones that are the ones. Uh, sweeping, the uh, would, sweeping would be uh, recommended. Uh, well, uh, I'm not sure about, I don't think there's a, been a research study to look at that, uh, but that might be an interesting research proposal. Yeah. Thank you. Do you have any more questions? Okay, so thank you again, Dr. Ruff, for your um, talk today. And as mentioned at the beginning, 
Um, there will be a link that all of you will receive um, for a survey, and it would be great if you could just give some feedback regards to uh, today's session. Um, and hope you all take care and keep safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.